Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. With less than two weeks to go, both the DFL and Republican Party chairs are here to talk about the upcoming midterm elections, plus an in-depth look at the man who designed our beautiful state capitol. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. As we head into the midterm elections, Minnesota is a battleground state with fiercely competitive races for Congress, the governor's office, and control of both the state Senate and the House of Representatives. Ken Martin is chair of the Minnesota DFL party, and he joins me to offer his perspective on some of the leading issues facing voters. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. With all of the competitive races that I just mentioned, including campaign visits by national leaders like Speaker Paul Ryan and former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, to what extent is Minnesota now a bellwether state? Well, I'm not sure it's a bellwether, but it's certainly the epicenter of the 2018 midterm elections. We have more competitive uh, races on the ballot than about any other state in the country. Uh, you know, two U.S. Senate races, an open governorship, four nationally targeted congressional races, a nationally targeted legislative chamber, and of course a state spent, uh, Senate special election that will determine the majority. So there's a lot on the ballot, there's a lot going on here, there's a lot of investments uh, both in the state and out of the state, and uh, it will be exciting to see what happens over the next uh, couple of weeks here. It will be exciting. Putting aside all polls for the moment, as party chair, what do you consider to be the leading issue or issues that voters are concerned about right now? Well, one of the things that we've been hearing for many months now that people are concerned with here in Minnesota is health care. They want to make sure that their health care uh, continues, that those with pre-existing conditions are covered. They want to see premiums lowered. They want to see more accessibility, particularly in rural Minnesota where we're facing a health care crisis with so many uh, people not being able to uh, uh, find health care clinics or uh, close to their home. Uh, they have to drive hundreds of miles. Uh, there's also a rural uh, health care pro uh, provider shortage, as you know. Doctors and nurses uh, just aren't plentiful in greater Minnesota. So there's a real crisis right now in greater Minnesota on health care. But we're frankly seeing that all over in the suburbs, in the urban parts of the state. Uh, the reality is, is that people uh, are very concerned with what's happening with health care right now. And they believe that Democrats have a plan and Republicans don't. Uh, and we'll see uh, on Election Day if they're going to continue to vote uh, on health care. There are high stakes in the upcoming election and the amount of advertising dollars that are being spent on negative and misleading ads, which are funded in particular by outside groups, is significant. So what is the best way, in your view, for voters to get to the truth? Well, look, I just heard today, unfortunately, that uh, Minnesota is number, thir uh, number three in terms of uh, total outside spending uh, coming into our state uh, behind uh, California and Texas. So that should tell you something about how important Minnesota is this election cycle. The best way to get to the truth is to uh, do your research, uh, do a lot of research, try to talk to the candidates, try to talk to the campaign. Uh, the reality is, is there's a lot of misinformation out there, as you mentioned, on both sides, a lot of negative ads. Uh, and I think what the best thing you can do is just to make sure that you get online, do your research, talk to people, talk to friends and neighbors, talk to people who know the candidates. And if you're uh, fortunate to, talk to the candidates and really uh, make them uh, answer your questions and what your hopes and your dreams, your aspirations are for the future. Make sure they know how you feel and what direction you think the state uh, should be heading in. What impact do you anticipate that women will have on this uh, upcoming election, especially considering the Me Too movement? Uh, and is your party shaping its message differently in any way to address women's concerns? Well, look, I mean, uh, the Me Too movement uh, clearly has not only uh, had an impact in politics, but it's having an impact uh, throughout society. And thankfully, I, I think we need to address a lot of the very serious allegations out there. Uh, we need to make sure that women uh, can be supported and feel like they can bring their stories forward. Uh, and I think, you know, for me, this is really the year of the woman. If you look at uh, candidates that we've recruited up and down the ballot, we, uh, two, two, we have two U.S. senators who are women candidates. Uh, we have, uh, you know, two congressional candidates uh, in CD2 and CD5 who are women candidates. So many of our legislative uh, recruits are women candidates. And I think at the end of the day for us, uh, we know that uh, when women run, women win. 
uh, the Democrats uh, have supported women uh, in terms of the policies that we support, everything from pay equity to reproductive uh, health issues to uh, d uh, ending discrimination in the workplace. You know, a number of issues, uh, earn and paid uh, sick leave, which is really important for women uh, and for families, frankly. The DFL has always stood on the side of women, uh, and that's why you see such a sizable gender gap in politics. Uh, we have a very sizable lead with women voters compared to the Republicans, and that's because we've been standing up and fighting for women and for families uh, in the legislature here in St. Paul and in Washington. So I think it's a really important uh, for us to continue to deliver on those promises that we've made to women, to stand up and con to continue to support them, particularly in this Me Too movement, but beyond, and, and to make sure that at the end of the day, we are recruiting and grooming women to be future leaders uh, and, and getting involved in politics. What, if any, work has your party done to move both independent voters and also those DFLers who voted for President Trump in the last election? Well, one of the things that I think is important to remember is that in 2016, there were a lot of people, not just independents and sort of moderate Republicans who voted for uh, Trump, but, but there were some Democrats too. And part of what I learned from the 2016 elections is that um, we need people to see us standing up and fighting for them. A lot of people felt like we weren't fighting for them anymore. And I'll, I'll share a story with you. Wendy Anderson, uh, former governor of Minnesota, in 2012 I was fortunate enough to be a founding board, members, uh, a founding board member of Minnesotans United for All Families, which was a campaign uh, that um, fought against uh, um, the uh, marriage amendment here. And during that campaign I asked uh, Governor Anderson, how do you think gay marriage is gonna play in greater Minnesota? And one thing he said to me, I, I, I just thought it was fascinating. He goes, you know what, people in greater Minnesota are good people. They don't mind if you fight for the poor, or they fight, you fight for immigrants, or you fight for the LGBTQ community, as long as they feel like you're fighting for them as well. If they feel like you forgot them, or you left them behind, they're going to leave you. And I thought that was really fascinating because in 2016, so many people, felt like we weren't fighting for them anymore. We had 19 of our 87 counties here in Minnesota flip from Obama to Trump in 2016. So I have no doubt that every racist and misogynist in this country supported Donald Trump, but not every Trump supporter was a racist and misogynist. And so for me, it's really important for us to get those voters back. And what drove their vote in 2016 was their economic anxiety, their, their fear uh, that they were being left behind or forgotten. We have to stand up and fight for everyone. Paul Wellstone, who I used to work for, taught me that. He could organize uh, farmers in southern Minnesota. He could go up to the Iron Range and talk to them. He could come down to the inner uh, city and talk to immigrants and refugees. He had the same message, united around the American dream. And it, his slogan was, we all do better when we all do better. And that's really what we have to get back to, to get those people back. Well, in, in a sense, you're sort of answering my question, but, but one more thing. The Secretary of, State, the Secretary of State's office said that no excuse absentee voting ballots are three times the number in the last midterm election. They've already outpaced uh, the 2016 presidential election. Clearly, the electorate is motivated to vote. Why should citizens cast, ballot, cast their ballot for a DFL candidate? Well, look, first off, it's astounding that we're already ahead of the 2016 uh, early vote numbers. And that uh, portends, hopefully, in the next uh, couple weeks here, record high turnout here in Minnesota. As you know, we always lead the nation yes, in do. voter turnout, and I expect that to be the case again. But I think if uh, people, uh, the reason people should vote for DFL candidates is if they want to see a party uh, uh, in government working for them and standing up and making sure they have uh, access to affordable health care, they should vote for DFLers. If they want to make sure that we're investing in a K-12 education system that works for every child regardless of where they live, they should uh, vote for the DFL. If they want to vote for, um, if they want to see a government that's actually focused on uh, building um, a world-class uh, uh, communities and infrastructure that works in every part of the state, including rural broadband and fixing our roads and bridges, then they should vote for the DFL. You know, Tim Walls, our candidate, is running on a campaign of one Minnesota, and that's what the DFL is. Wherever you live, whatever your background, uh, we're fighting for you, and we're fighting for all of Minnesota. Chair Martin, thank you for your time today. Thank you.
Earlier this month, I spoke with Jennifer Carnahan, chair of the state's Republican Party, for her perspective on some of the key issues facing our state. I began by asking her about the impact of President Trump's two recent visits to the state. Any time we can get the president in Minnesota is always a good thing. And as you mentioned, the fact that we've now had him twice is incredible because when the president comes into the state, it just energizes and mobilizes and inspires these uh, supporters of the president and also supporters of our other Republican candidates about how important this election cycle is. And I really think it motivates and encourages people to get out and vote because they know what's at stake. Putting aside all polls for the moment, as party chair, what do you consider to be the leading issues that voters are concerned about? I think there's a lot of issues that are on people's mind. You know, they're the issues that we sort of hear about in the media all the time. I mean, health care is still a big one in this state because people that are on the individual market are still uh, negatively impacted with high prices and premiums, and there still hasn't been, you know, a full solution for that. You know, also the economy and jobs, and especially Minnesota, you know, we are a thriving center for a base of a lot of Fortune 500 companies based on our density, in addition to other mid-size and small-size uh, organizations, both in the private sector and public sector, and to make sure that we keep our economy strong for future generations and keep the growth robust, I think is very important. And, you know, education is all, also a key topic. We've got great educational institutions here uh, from colleges down to, you know, elementary schools and making sure that we are uh, educating our children and, again, setting up for the future is critically important. We mentioned the economy, and I wanted to ask you if, in your view, the president's trade policies um, have rattled his supporters in any way, particularly the farmers who, who are facing some tariff issues in getting their products to market. You know, it's interesting because I've spent some time in southern Minnesota over the course of this election cycle. I've been down there many times, and I've talked with farmers and people that own, you know, larger cooperatives. And I, the sentiment that I've heard on the ground is not one of concern and uh, being scared, but is one of more optimism and hope that, you know, we needed to be strong on trade and that the farmers down there are going to be, they're willing to be patient and see how this plays out. Coming out of the convention, uh, all of the federal and state GOP endorsed candidates won their primary elections, which is quite an accomplishment. What does this mean for the party and for the process going forward? You know, that primary was so positive on a number of levels, but as you said, having all those federal and statewide candidates win, it really reinforced the importance of our grassroots and the process. You know, there are people that show up all over the state. They're the ones that go walk in parades with candidates, pound in lawn signs, help us as we go knock on doors. They show up at monthly meetings. They organize these conventions, you know, at the county level, the BPOU level, the congressional level, and then they show up at the state convention. So their voice is important and does matter, and that carried throughout for all of these candidates. So I think it shows that this process is important, that it stands for something, and that being a grassroots activist and leader in Minnesota does have a direct impact on our candidates and the elections. I'd like to turn to um, the Me Too movement. Uh, after becoming chair of the Republican Party, you revealed that you had been the target of some racist and sexual, or sex, sexist, I apologize, sexist attacks. In this era of Me Too and the recent high profile cases of sexual, alleged sexual misconduct against powerful men, what in particular is your message to women? You know, I think there's a couple of, a couple of things here with that issue. You know, women should not be afraid to stand up and speak out. And I think when you look at the history of time, I mean, especially my generation, Generation X, you know, a lot of women have faced experiences that are less than desirable and you wouldn't wish upon anyone to experience uh, ever. But they're afraid to come forward for whatever reason it might be. You know, maybe they're ashamed, maybe they're embarrassed, uh, whatever it is. I have many friends who have been through things like that and, you know, my heart goes out to them all the time. So, well, in Gen X, it just wasn't something, it was sort of, this is just how it yeah. is. Yeah, and that's what I mean by Gen X. I feel like, you know, when I was in college, for example, or right out of college and things happened, you just weren't, it wasn't at the heightened level of awareness that it is today. So I think it's important that, you know, there's been a level of awareness brought to it and people are, you know, standing behind women who come out. So I think that's one side of it. The other side of it is I think some of it uh, has been used for political purposes and the polarization going on in our country. And you hate to see when that happens because you don't want to undermine uh, the severity and the emotions and the challenges that some of these women have faced. 
Politics, politicians like to say, especially when they win, that elections have consequences. So why should voters vote Republican in this upcoming election? What's your pitch? You know, our pitch, and it's been this way uh, for the past two years, you know, our country has reached a point where we can either continue to move forward and stand up for our Constitution and our freedoms and uh, make America a prosperous place for future generations. And I think that's what was on the line in 2016, and that's on the line again in 2018. So I really encourage people to get out there and vote this year and to really look at the issues that the candidates are talking about. You know, do we want Minnesota, for example, our state, which we live in, to be a state that is going to promote economic freedom, open markets, giving families all the opportunities to achieve their American dream, no matter what it is, and not have government stand in the way, you know, by overtaxing, putting regulations, frankly, restricting people on what they can do, or is that the path we want to go? And I think that we're going to see that Minnesotans are going to be more for continuing to fight for the American dream. Jennifer Carnahan, chair of the State Republican Party, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. The Legislative Task Force on Child Protection met this week to review recommendations, initiatives, and recently passed legislation. The disparities geographically are different. I mean, there's a, like, for example, I'll just my, I, I know what your constituents are facing. I've looked at the numbers. In my area, for example, we'll have, and I don't want to be broad in general, but just to illustrate a point, I mean, we'll have groups of families where people will say, oh, they're going to go through the system. And the reason I bring this up is because it's not the county social workers who are making those. Remember, they're, they're not making the reports. Somebody made that referral, some mandatory reporter. And what I see in my area, and I'll speak from my area, is someone will, a teacher or remember, even a coach or a community member can report a family because they see or they feel something's not right there rather than knowing right where to go. And my, my fear is what we've created in this system is it's really easy to call social services and have them go through the screened in process. It's really hard to go to that family and say, what do you really need? Uh, you know, what, what are you struggling with? Maybe you just lost your job. You know, maybe dad's going through a tough time. I mean, it, and I know this is uh, oversimplification, but there was a time when social services was the last call and the first call was you put your arm around your neighbor and say, hey, I see you lost your job. How do we get you through this? And so th that's why I bring that level of distinction up because I'm worried that in today's day of, of worrying about liabilities and all that, you just pick up the phone, you send them to the county when I think we're too quick to that. I agree <laughs> totally. Like, I'm with you. I'm just trying to figure out how we figure that out. Yep. Right. Okay. Like, yep. I, don't, I don't get where the how Mr. Sorensen or someone is going to make the determination that when the coach or the mm -hmm. teacher or the librarian called that there could have been another call that have been made to help this family upstream. I'm trying to figure out how do we figure that out and the, the data that is that I know that we get is coming from when it's been reported and then the determination that's made when it's reported. So I'm trying to figure out how do we yep. get upstream. Right. I think when we can look back at the 93 recommendations and the conversation that was at the table back in 2014, 2015, that the priority was that, that people would report and they would report to, you know, child protection. Um, and that's kind of like the process that we have created. Um, and I do agree that there should be another place first, like some type of support that maybe some families do need before we go to the place where we are removing and pulling kids out of the system. In 2015, um, the cost of Minnesota's child welfare system was $429 million. And in 2017, the cost uh, was $644 million. And so um, counties pay uh, about $287 million of that. The feds pay about 160 million of that, and the state pays about 167 million of those funds. And so, as we think about the growth in Minnesota's child welfare system, um, you know, I'm here to um, hopefully advocate this as a priority um, in terms of the need for additional state funds to complete some of the things that we've started in terms of implementation of these recommendations.
Renowned architect Cass Gilbert grew up right here in St. Paul and parlayed his design of the Minnesota State Capitol into a successful national career, designing many important public buildings across the country. Historian Brian Pease tells us more about Minnesota's celebrity architect. We've been highlighting the design and various aspects of the state capitol, but we haven't spent much time on the architect. And as we stand here next to this bust of Cass Gilbert, tell us who he was. Yeah, he was, uh, of course, the architect that designed this building. He had a huge hand in everything. And so he not only designed the floor plans and all the elements inside, but he designed the furniture. He was a hands-on architect who liked to, you know, work with the artists and work on commissioned works of art and ideas and concepts. So his hand is everywhere within this building. And, and he comes from St. Paul. He, he was born in Ohio, moved to St. Paul as a young uh, boy, and then pretty much uh, lived his formative years here. He worked as an apprentice carpenter down in Hastings and then went on to uh, school at MIT for a year and took a grand tour of Europe where he saw all the great buildings of Europe at that time and then uh, came back here and then opened a pretty much a small architectural firm with a partner and they did a lot of residences and buildings in St. Paul before he was given this commission. About his European experiences, Cass Gilbert wrote that what he saw there really shaped, the beauty shaped his aesthetic. He came back to the U.S., worked in New York for a time, but as you said, eventually came back to St. Paul mm -hmm. because he believed that his architectural career would benefit from a smaller market. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. He, he always, you know, he worked for McKim, Mead & White, which was the foremost architectural firm in New York City, all pretty much well known throughout the United States at that time. And so I think he always looked in the, to, into the future, maybe getting aligned with them or connected with them or even moving out to New York City, which does happen eventually. But, you know, being from St. Paul, he was able to make connections here. He grew up here. He knew a lot of the people. One of the first buildings he built was a house for his mother. And that was, a, as a young architect, kind of a place to establish himself. And then he was given commissions or got hired to do other projects throughout St. Paul. And then... Uh, what made him important as an architect was he had this vision and these ideas and that's where that European tour really cemented some of the ideas that he incorporates into buildings he later builds as a, as a young architect and as an older architect, a well-established architect known internationally by the time he died in 1934. One scholar I read talked about how Gilbert was so good at politicking, about cultivating different artists and engineers and, and other people he needed to create the vision of a project. How does that show up in the state capitol? Well, he, he was a shrewd uh, businessman, and he uh, was a part of the Town and Country Club. He was a part of the Minnesota Club. He was a part of the Minnesota Bulk Club. And other members in, that, in those mem organizations are the business leaders. They're the prominent politicians. They're the movers and shakers of St. Paul. So he's smart enough to know I have to start rubbing elbows with a lot of these important people because that's where the commissions will be coming in the future. So he was, uh, worked with Jim, you know, James J. Hill for some of those projects, and he worked with other well-known, you know, Channing Seabury. You know, he later became a commissioner, but he knew him. He lived a couple houses down from where his mother lived. He uh, knew a lot of the, the business people in downtown St. Paul. He was commissioned to do uh, warehouses for some of those men. And so, yeah, he was a shrewd kind of politician and mover and shaker, and he was trying to work his way up in the uh, kind of the, the upper levels of St. Paul culture and, and society that way. In getting the state capital contract, he had to coordinate efforts for all kinds of people, engineers, artists. He was really good at, at bringing lots of people together for his vision. How did he go about doing that? Oh, once again, it, it, it's kind of his personality. I think he was a hard driving person. Um, he had an artistic flair too. He was a watercolor artist, very accomplished. And so he could kind of in his mind envision what he wanted for this building, especially the state capitol, what he wanted it to appear. And so you're right, he was bringing in uh, great relationships with some of the foremost artists of the time period. He was, of course, had to work well with that board of capital commissioners because they're the ones who are actually rubber stamping or saying, go ahead, move forward with this. And so he's building relationships with contractors and 
And of course, any project this size, you're going to butt heads with your general contractors and other vendors because they're maybe not doing the work you want it the way done, the way you want it done, or they're maybe behind. And so when you read through some of the documents and the correspondences, you know, there are some struggles going on, but I think everyone left this project in 1905 understanding that this was one of the great, you know, projects that as a team we can accomplish a lot of great things. And, and for instance, you know, he had to persuade the capital commissioners to get more money to put art in the building. Gilbert had already, you know, originally wanted some art throughout the big public spaces, but there was never enough money. There was never really a desire by those commissioners to get that done. So he took them on a junket out east to go to all the new buildings that were being built at this time, the Library of Congress, which was kind of the, the basic kind of floor plan or the, f of the blueprint for this building, for the decoration. And, and those commissioners came back to St. Paul and said, we got to do that same thing here for our state capital. We have to spend the money to make this work and make it a very beautiful building. So he knew you know, where to push, where to pull back, and kind of, kind of have his, his influence is very evident throughout this building by having those good working relationships. And the Minnesota State Capitol then became the launching point for a national career. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, in 1899, uh, he moved from St. Paul with his family to New York City. So as he, when he got the commission for the U.S. Custom House in New York City, in the letter he wrote to his wife, he has a little ship he drew in the corner, and it says, our ship has arrived. And so they basically, we're on our way to, uh, to New York City. And, and so he later went on to build the U.S. Custom House in the early 1900s. He built the Woolworth Building, that was the tallest building in the world until the Chrysler Building came online in the 1920s. And then he, uh, his final large project was the U.S. Supreme Court Building. With architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, you clearly see the design aesthetic in, in any building that they did. But with Cass Gilbert, his is more of an integration of lots of different types of architecture, from the neo-Gothic like you see in the Woolworth Building to the Beaux-Arts that you see here in this Capitol Building. Was that a unique trait of Cass Gilbert's to be able to incorporate different elements for different buildings? I think it's kind of the, the time period he was coming up as an architect. You have, you have all these influence of the Richardsonian Romanesque architectures, these big forbidding, big archways of stone. Plus you have the lightweight, kind of the gothic, you know, triangles and the, the different uh, lighthearted kind of gingerbread type stuff. And Queen Anne, if you look at his house in St. Paul that he built, it's a, a combination of shingles and Queen Anne and it's just a eclectic version of all kinds of different architectural styles incorporated in one building. And so that was, I think, his, his master genius in all of this is he was able to take in whatever project it was, he was able to take traditional elements and make it into a very modern functioning building. So when you look at the state capitol, the goal was to have it look like something you would see if you walked into a, a public building in Italy in 1500. Well, inside in 1905, you had working elevators, you had electric lights, you had everything that a modern building would have. So he's using this aesthetic of the, the past to incorporate stories into the future or into the present and into the future. And so when you look at his buildings, they really are this really kind of a, a neat vision of his to put traditional with modern elements. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.